Hello and uh, welcome to Transit Display. And this is going to be the first uh, lecture for the Fractions Lecture Series of the year. So thank you for coming today. Uh, today marks an important date, uh, April 20th, I think you're all familiar with. Uh, let's put a little bit of a martial gaze in this. And uh, it's when uh, France declared its first uh, war as a new republic, 19, uh, 1792, against Prussia. So, uh, keeping that military perspective, uh, perspective in mind. I'm going to introduce to you Antoine Bousquet. Uh, he's a senior lecturer. Well, I'll give a quick bio. He's a senior lecturer uh, at the Burbeck College, University of London. Uh, his main research interests are concerned with war and political violence, the history and philosophy of science and technology, and social and political theory in the digital age. He is the author of The Scientific Way of Warfare, Order and Chaos on the Battlefields of Modernity. This was published in 2009. Uh, and has published various articles in a range of peer-reviewed journals and has given invited talks to international audiences at universities, military academies, think tanks, and cultural centers. So today we bring to you the function of the image uh, in the age of mechanic uh, destruction. So uh, welcome tonight and I'll let him uh, speak now. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thanks to, to Dustin for inviting me. Thanks to Transit Display for hosting me. And thanks to all of you for taking some time to come and see this. So what I want to do today, I'm going to talk to you about a piece of work that really comes out of a long-term research project I've been spending a number of years on. Uh, a project that is entitled The Martial Gaze and is really an inquiry into the logistics of military uh, perception, that's to say how do military, what's the history of military perception and how does the development of perception correlate with the targeting of force. And in the book, which hopefully will be out at some point next year in the Minnesota Press, um, I consider three key components um, to what I call, following Paul Virilio's terminology, the logistics of military perception. There's a dimension of sensing, the, the way in which military um, sense and increase the span of their sensorial nets. There's a function of imaging, the ways in which sensorial perceptions are coded into images, are captured into images that can then be distributed, uh, analyzed, and so on. And then there's activities of mapping that are the correlation of perception to geospatial frameworks, which are going to be crucial when it comes to directing force against specific entity or positions. These three functions are quite closely inter inter intertwined, functionally uh, uh, in particular, and, but I'm going to be focusing today with, on the category of the image. I'm going to suggest to you, propose to you, um, a tracing of the role of the image in the practices of uh, weapons targeting to underline how the production, analysis and distribution of the image occupies a central functional role in the logistics of military perception. And to particularly submit to you that imaging is playing a crucial role in bringing the world in which we live in ever more into the ambit of targeting. That's to say that military targeting increasingly operates on a planetary scale. Any position on the globe can be struck. And it operates increasingly in a very in an increasingly granular form. That's to say, it can increasingly target narrower, more specific targets. Ultimately, the individual, the human body. Today, the U.S. Air Force likes to um, boast that its nuclear and conventional precision strike forces can credibly threaten and effectively conduct global strike by holding any target on the planet at risk and, if necessary, disabling or destroying it promptly, even from bases in the continental United States. And I would say that's increasingly the condition, the martial condition in which we live. We live in a world in which force can be deployed on a global scale um, at, at a moment's notice. But the story I want to tell you uh, begins in the Italian Quattrocento and the Renaissance invention of linear perspective. What is perspective? Well, 
as simply as possible, put as simply as possible, perspective is a geometric technique for the creation of images that represent physical space and the depiction of objects within it in a manner that approximates the experience of situated human vision. In other words, when you look at the perspectival image, it mimics, it resembles the kinds of visual effects that you would have through embodied vision, or at least a version of it. In particular, perspectival images have uh, an obvious illusion of depth. The convergence of parallel lines to single vanishing points creates that sense of depth. This also means, uh, because of its geometric construction, that the relative sizes and proportions of objects are accorded with their position within space. So distant objects are smaller than close objects, presuming that they have a similar objective size. And it's important to understand, of course, familiar with perspective as a, as a very significant moment in the history of Western art, but it's important to understand that perspective is also the paradigmatic expression of a wider conjoined process of mathematization of space and rationalization of vision. You have to hold these two together. Simultaneously, space is being mathematized and vision is being rationalized. That's to say that perspe perspective art emerged intertwined with the development of a science of optics. The science of optics that relied on geometry and explained human vision by precisely the same geometric principles. Why is it that distant objects look smaller uh, than close objects? And what both perspective and this new science of optics says is that it's the angle of vision from the eye to a given object that determines its perceived size. Right? So the, the, the theory is there are visual rays, if you want, you can imagine visual rays from the eye to an object, and the angle formed by the ray that hits the top of the object and the bottom gives you the, 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 the impression of size. Right? And that size might be because the object is, the distance of it will, will correlate with the size of it. In other words, the eye, in the terminology of the day, casts a visual pyramid. Now, the same principles underlie the technique of surveying, used for the determination of <coughs> terrestrial positions and distances. Right? So if you want to survey the land, if you want to find out uh, how far an object is, how, what size it is, if you want to produce maps that are going to be uh, not simply symbolic maps, but are going to correlate to some, in some way or fashion with the actual physical lay of the land, then you use very similar principles. And one of the areas in which uh, surveying came to play a significant role was in early gunnery. So the development of early cannons, early uh, uh, firearms. Now the reason why surveying is, is useful because it increases your chances of hitting your target. If you can make an estimation of the distance between the, far, the, between the weapon and uh, the target, then you can adjust the aim of the weapon without having necessarily to make preliminary shots, without having to, to guess and to adjust on a case-by-case on -case basis. And the way in which ranging, which is what we might refer to in the military sense, ranging applies simple trigono tr trigonometric principles, which actually were known by the ancient Greeks, lost thereafter and rediscovered through the circulation of texts via the Islamic world in the early Renaissance period. If you re recall perhaps your uh, secondary school math classes, then you might recall the basic principles of trigonometry, which is that if you take a triangle and you know the distance between two sides of that triangle, or what if you know the, 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 sense, the size of one side of that triangle, and you know two of the angles formed by that triangle, then through fairly simple calculations, you can calculate the remaining angle, as up to 180, and the remaining length. So, in other words, to survey very simply, all you need is to know the distance between these two surveying points, then measure the angles of vision to it, and then you can work out the distance to the object being sighted. 
Returning to the perspectival image, it's important to understand that what the perspectival image actually is, is simply a planar section of the visual pyramid. And you, you, you have these pyramids of vision, and then if you cut that pyramid at a particular point, the image form there will be a perspectival image. The image, in other words, acts as a window through which the viewer appears, such that the depicted space presents itself as an immediate extension of the viewer's physical space. And for this illusion to be sustained, you need to rigorously apply these underlying geometric principles. And that's what the early perspective artists did, is offer the techniques, the means to produce images that apply these geometric principles. Now, crucially, what this means is that there is a single optical, optically correct position from which to view a perspectival image. That image is designed to be seen from a... There's only one position that you can view that image that will convey fully the illusion of depth, the, the apex, if you want, of that visual pyramid. This means that perspectival representation simultaneously fixes and records the relative positions and proportions of objects in the depicted space and the location of the point from which the scene is being viewed. This means that the great stillness of the Renaissance painting is not simply that of the scene depicted, but it's also that of the viewer. The viewer is being fixed as well as the scene depicted in the image. And one common reading of perspective is that perspective was important in the development of uh, a nascent humanism because it enthroned a sovereign human subject, it arranged the visible world as its private spectacle. That, that perspectival art, Renaissance art, was a break with uh, pre-modern art, which had, was, was in the Middle Ages dominated by a religious understanding. And therefore, what was depicted in religious painting was not the view of man, but the view of, of divine being. Right? You, you didn't accord ob, uh, objects with their real size. You depicted Christ as much bigger than other characters because he was symbolically more important. You weren't trying to depict realistically. But of course, that's what pers perspective does. And there's an, so there's been a recurrent idea that actually what perspective was significant because it advanced a conception of a physical world existing within a measurable and homogeneous Euclidean space that could be therefore rationally understood and controlled. So one interpretation of perspective is was perspective uh, um, elevated this new figure of the human who now has new powers of rational control over the world. But I think that's only part of the story. Because what is missing from this account is that the human subject is simultaneously objectified as an object of rational knowledge that occupies the same mathematized space and whose embodied perception is subordinated to abstract laws of vision. In other words, vision is no longer something that's just embodied in the individual according to a phenomenology that we can only barely, that we can imperfectly grasp. It follows geometric rules that are universal and that can be <coughs> calculated. And once vision becomes subject to abstract laws, then you have the basis on which perception can be subsequently mechanized and automated. It can be disembedded, if you want, from the, the, the human body. So from the earliest days of perspectival representation, there was a search for ways to dispense with the laborious geometric methods required for the production of these images. I mean, it's very practical. If you're trying to teach artists to do uh, perspectival images, well, m not many of them are going to be skilled geometric geometrists. You want to find shortcuts to producing these kinds of images. There's many devices that do this. One is, is the one presented here by uh, Albrecht Dürer, which is a contraption in which the visual rays from the model to the viewer are materialized through a piece of string, whose positions from a given model are transferred onto a screen. So the idea here is that you would take measurements from each point on the object, drawing that string from a particular point on the wall, that point on the wall is the position of the eye, right? the apex of the visual pyramid, and then you 
capture those measurements <laughs> through this section of the pyramid, uh, a screen in which you can place key dots and then you could fill out the painting. This device is from 1525 is just part of a long lineage of devices that culminate in the invention of the photographic camera in the 1840s. It's important to understand that the camera appears as the product of a concerted effort to design a machine that produces images in the manner of those painted within European post-Renaissance art. So the camera, the photographic camera is in a way a culmination of all these technologies, all these attempts to make a machine that can automatically produce perspectival images. And in fact, what makes the photographic camera in the end is the invention of a chemical means to fix the images that could be obtained through optical devices. So prior to the, to, 18, to the 1840s, you could produce optical images that looked like Renaissance paintings because you could concentrate light through uh, uh, optical devices. The camera obscura is a simple device of that nature. But what you didn't have is a way of fixing it. The chemical properties of chemical uh, processes discovered in the 1830s and 40s allow you to fix that. As a result, the camera is immediately described as an artificial eye, one that is perceived as having an objectivity that grants it a special claim to visual truth. And whether we accept that claim or not, and indeed there's a lot of various critiques developed to question that uh, objectivity or claimed objectivity, it is certain that photography has been extensively put to work in recording, classifying and ordering reality. Very soon, there are attempts to exploit the fact that photographic images are composed in accordance with perspectival geometry, that therefore they contain accurate measurements of the relative positions and proportions of objects contained within them. Because if a perspectival image contains the measurements of objects displayed from a particular perspective, if you apply the inverse geometric calculations, you can extract those measurements. You can discover what the measurements, the relative measurements of the objects within that space are. So for instance, very quickly in the 1850s, there are attempts to obtain or to produce maps of areas uh, or to perform the architectural surveys of buildings through photographs. This is a technique that becomes known subsequently as photogrammetry, measurement through photographs. You take pictures and then you try to extract the information, the visual and therefore spatial information that's contained within these images. With the decrease in the necessary length of exposure to light, photographs become furthermore able to arrest motion and new applications suggest themselves. In 1882, Etienne Jules Marais presents to the world his chronophotographic gun, a rapid firing camera in the shape of a rifle. It's capable of taking 12 photographs per second and it can be used for the studies of animal and human locomotion. Mechanically analogous to the Gatling machine gun invented a few decades earlier, the chronophotographic gun underlines the coincidence of the image and weapons targeting. Indeed, gun cameras resurfaced in the first decades of the 20th century. Here, the purpose is uh, not to uh, photographically arrest the motion of animals, to study their motion, rather it's to find a realistic yet safe means to train aerial gunners. So in the First World War, you, you've got aircraft taking up to the sky and some aerial battles going on. The problem is how do you train an aerial gunner? You can't train them with live munition, at least that's probably ill-advised. So someone came up with the idea of uh, a photographic camera gun. So you train the pilot to fire at uh, uh, targets and then every time they fired it, the camera gun would take a picture and you'd be able to measure how accurate their aim was. So here for example are some of the images produced by the camera gun. They superimpose um, a, a, um, a reticle that allows you to see well, how close the aim the gunner was. But this is essentially the same invention as Marais' chronophotographic gun, but this time it's quite clearly, rather than just being a photographic camera that looks like a gun, it's a, it's a camera that serves 
the purpose in improving the aim of real weapons. But the really crucial role that photography would play in the, conduct, uh, in the First World War and beyond is the conduct of aerial photograph photography. And this comes to the fore, of course, in the First World War. And the First World War is particularly suited for that because uh, of the static trench warfare that it quickly settles into. You have massed armies over extended fronts confronting one another, and therefore a battle space that is placed under intense surveillance. You want to know what the enemy is doing, you want to know what they're planning, uh, and uh, this is all essential intelligence. And the best way to do this is from the air. And the best way to capture information or the view from the air is the camera. Once you produce photographs, you can bring them back to the rear, you can analyze them, you can assemble them into maps, you can geolocate the positions of uh, the enemy, notably artillery positions, and then you can feed these coordinates back into to, to your own artillery that can then direct fire at it. So you've got a kind of targeting cycle where you send aircraft to collect, to take photographs, collect information about the position of the enemy, extract that, and then send that on to the weapon system. This uh, practice of aerial photography would only become more important in the Second World War. Because in the Second World War, uh, aerial bombing becomes a major dimension. In the First World War, it was a very minor one. In the Second World War, doctrines of strategic bombing are developed, where the idea is you have to uh, target the enemy, the enemy's industrial and infrastructure, industry and infrastructural support. So this is this is total war. States are fighting with their entire economic resources. So if you can destroy the economic foundations of that state's uh, military, you can win the war. So photography becomes used to not only map where the enemy's troops are, but to understand the entire economy, the entire logistical infrastructure of that state. And this pour over the images in order to extract valuable information about the production process, about the logistical chains, and so on, and feed that into the targeting process. Analysts notably uh, make use of the techniques of stereopsis. Um, that's the eff effect of depth perception you get when you look at two closely overlapping images. Because we're all familiar with 3D, 3D films, the 3D effects is effectively this is how it works. You have two very close, but slightly different images that are shown to a different eye, and that creates a sense of depth perception. Uh, analysts use that technique in order to acquire further information, to get a sense of what's the, what the size of the objects are. Uh, and that becomes a, a major technique. Now, this intense surveillance from the air leads to a raft of countermeasures to conceal and to disguise valuable sites. This is camouflage that has to be conceived so as to, be, to appear undetectable to the intelligence analyst's sustained scrutiny of photographs. So the job of camouflage uh, units becomes to prepare for or to try to fool the camera eye because that's what's ultimately going to be looked at. So here we have a, an image of a camouflage trainee in New York in 1942 who is correcting the work she was doing on the model by reference to overhead photographs. She would have started to do her first attempt at camouflaging uh, units or installations. Photographs are taken and then she can see how well her job, how well her job looks from the point of view of the camera and then further corrections are made. So you can see how the image becomes crucial both in detecting uh, where, identifying where positions are but also in the counter conduct in the efforts to counter that, you, you have to become the eye of the camera as well. The advent of the space age uh, and satellite reconnaissance uh, elevates the camera eye into the stratosphere. So the Cold War was dominated by the nuclear stalemate, by 
a strategy adopted by both the US and the Soviet Union of nuclear deterrence. But nuclear deterrence, in other words, the strategy of convincing your opponent that there is nothing to be gained in preemptively attacking you, that even if they attack you first with their nuclear weapons, you will survive sufficiently to retaliate in kind. In order to do this, you need to have a clear understanding of your enemy's capabilities, where their valuable targets are, what their own nuclear stocks are. And these have to be closely matched, because if there's an imbalance between them, if your enemy acquires too many nuclear weapons relative to you, nuclear strategists tell us, they have an incentive to attack, because they, 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 they might think that they could survive, they could win the war. So acquiring intelligence became crucial, and the most effective means to do so in this period was to send cameras in orbit, to send satellites up in the, in, in, in the stratosphere, to orbit the planet, to take photographs that are going to provide you with very detailed images of uh, the enemy's capabilities. This, for example, is an image from uh, the Corona missions uh, that took place in the 1960s under the US, under US command. And this is a photograph of uh, Washington, D.C. from 19. 67. And you can already see uh, really in great detail the kinds of images that you, can, uh, uh, that you can obtain. This of course has improved immeasurably since. It's thought that contemporary military satellites can resolve objects of no more than 10 centimeters in length. So the, the degree of detail that's obtained is quite formidable. But at the same time as the camera is uh, elevated into uh, orbit, something else fundamental happens to the image in the second half of the 20th century with the move to digital electronic imaging. This is critical because it denotes a profound and highly consequential shift in the underlying material ontology of the image. To say what the image, how the image is actually materially produced. Traditional photography consists in the registration of optically focused intensities of light onto photosensitive chemicals. It's a combined optical and chemical process. But electronic image acquisition operates in a quite different way. It involves the transduction of radiant energy into patterns of electric current rendered as statistical ensembles of discrete numerical values. This means that the electronic image is first and foremost a mathematical entity. It's a set of numbers before it is a visual one. So a digital image is really nothing more than a statistical set that can then be presented in any form, in any number of visualizations. It's quite fundamentally different from the chemical process of traditional photography. This uh, ontological difference has uh, several important ramifications. Perhaps most important of all is that the digital image is far more amenable to manipulation and treatment via algorithmic procedures. That's not to say that analog photographs couldn't be submitted to algorithms, but digital image is obviously much more easily processed in that way. And one of the consequences of that is the development of autonomous machine vision. Autonomous or machine vision operates through the algorithmic processing of imagery for the automatic extraction of numerical and symbolic information. So a digital image is composed of any number of pixels. Each individual pixel is one piece of information. And you can then process the intensity of these pixels through a variety of algorithms. You look into the image for, for particular features, for particular patterns that might allow a machine to interpret the image, understand what it's seeing, or, have it, or, or, or correlate it with forms and patterns it's already memorized. In the military context, this allows for the identification or the recognition of targets without the need for the human eye. And this, of course, can lead to weapons 
that can be automatically guided to their target. If a weapon can see for itself, if it doesn't need to be guided by the human eye, it can guide itself. But before guidance could be achieved through machine vision, other solutions uh, had been previously sought. A particularly striking one is World War II's Project Pigeon, also known as Organic Control. Project Pigeon was the brainchild of uh, the eminent psychologist B.F. Skinner, sometimes known as the most famous psychologist of the 20th century, who was not a very known figure at, during the Second World War, but uh, shot the fame after it. Project Pigeon was Skinner's contribution to the American war effort, and it was conceived as an alternative to kamikaze guidance. This American scientist worked out that well. A very effective guidance weapon, guidance weapon, guided weapon is the kamikaze. Right? You get human to fly the weapon all the way to the target. But uh, as one of the post war reports put it, for reasons of economy as much as uh, 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 humanitarianism, a different option was uh, sought. And Skinner offered his own. Let me show you a quick video of uh, some of the work done on the Project Pigeon. So Project Pigeon relied on uh, the conditioning of pigeons and you have to train pigeons to become guidance systems and Skinner did much work with pigeons after that as well. So this is some of his earlier work. So one of the ways in which you did this is uh, to prepare the pigeons, fit onto their, uh, set them in the, uh, restrict their movement so that as in the manner that they would be inserted into the head of the missile, and then train them to peck at a moving point. Right? You condition them by rewarding the good behavior, by feeding them every time they do uh, what's required of them. What we saw earlier on was the pigeon being fitted with, his beak being fitted with a kind of metal cover that would act as a contact, so it would, uh, a signal would be sent, could be sent from the contact of the beak with um, a metal plate, for example. So that would act as a kind of control signal in order to uh, feed uh, information to uh, the, the propulsion or the navigation system of the missile. The final stage of the training would involve showing pigeons films of the kind of targets that we're looking for. This was thought designed as a naval weapon, so, so the pigeons would be expected to uh, guide missiles towards ships. So you showed them an image of a film footage of a, uh, of a ship and they would peck at it, uh, having been trained to do so. So here the, the image becomes the means by which you train the organism to perform a set of operations that will act as a guidance system. The head itself of uh, the missile would work like a camera obscura, it would focus optical light and it's on a screen that would be placed in front of the pigeon, the pigeon would peck the screen and the camera would adjust, oops, I need to find the slide again, and the pigeon would adjust uh, well, the, the pecking would issue con command controls to the corresponding command controls to the missile. Okay, 
This, in fact, is a, uh, a three-pigeon missile head. Uh, you would put three pigeons in there, the idea being that if you had three pigeons, they could democratically decide uh, what the instruction was, so you could uh, avoid aberrant pecking from a, from a rogue pigeon if you had uh, three of them. Now, in the end, Project Pigeon didn't ever see any deployment, uh, but Skinner claims that that's, this wasn't because the technology wasn't working, but because he had, in the end, a lot of trouble convincing uh, the military superior, uh, hierarchy that it wasn't a crackpot idea. But the military took this idea seriously enough that they revived it in the post-war period um, uh, and only abandoned it when, by then, other techniques of guidance, radar, infrared, were clearly superior to any organic system, and so the project ended there. This post-war period is indeed one in which a whole raft of guidance systems become developed. Here we have another one uh, which makes use of live radar returns. This is a, a, an early patent. Uh, the way in which this works is effectively by setting up in the guidance system pre-existing footage of the, the, the land that would be flown all over. So you, in the preliminary of that was you have to you would send a reconnaissance, reconnaissance flight, you would take images or film of the ground, you would store that into the warhead, and then you would correlate live, ra live radar uh, returns with the video footage. You bring those two images together, then the missile has some idea of whether it's on the right track or not. This is a very early kind of primitive uh, system, but it's, n it's neat because you can quite, quite easily see the mechanism uh, operating. But ultimately, uh, a descendant of that technology is one of the guidance technologies behind the Tomahawk cruise missile. We've heard about Tomahawks very recently uh, when the US sent about 50 of them into Syria. And the Tomahawk is arguably one of the most sophisticated weapon systems in the world. The unit cost of, of one of them is in the area of $1.5 million. So the US did basically send $75 million in into uh, a Syrian, Syrian airfield. In its terminal phase, Exotomoc is really a quite complex weapon system that uses a combination of GPS and other radar technologies. But in its terminal phase, the Tomahawk compares recorded images of the terrain, obtained through prior reconnaissance, with live optical imagery obtained through its onboard optical sensor. So effectively, the Tomahawk does see. Right? It's looking for a target that it's been uh, previously provided with, and it seeks to recognize it and to guide itself. And as a result, the Tomahawk is a, a remarkably accurate weapon it, uh, that can strike its target within the margin of error of a few meters. But the Tomahawk is only useful against previously identified targets. Right? The Tomahawk has to recognize the target. The target has to be previously recorded, identified, stored in the Tomahawk's guided missile system. The Tomahawk cannot independently choose a target. That, in a way, is the new, or the, the, the goal that current military technology is striving for. And discussion around the possibility of such technology is what has fueled a big debate around what's called lethal autonomous weapons. The idea that you could have drones, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, or other weapons that could, on their own, autonomously identify or determine that an entity is a target and make the decision to attack it independently. There's quite considerable technological obstacles to that, but it's quite clear that the technology is inching progressively towards it. And what you could you could make those type could make a machine that does that. Uh, it's just that the military at this point is probably not sufficiently confident in that technology that they would want to deploy it for now, anyway. Uh, other than in extremely constrained settings, so there are some anti anti missile systems that can operate, for example, in the Korean area in, in South Korea. There are defensive systems. Uh, that are capable of operating autonomously, uh, but, but they're looking for very specific target signatures, but they could operate without any human oversight. Similarly in Israel as well. But this emergence of machine vision that I've been talking about is, is, is a very important facet of the digitalization of imaging, but it's only one facet. Because if the digital image is nothing uh, but a statistical ensemble of numerical values, 
the correlate of that it is becomes very easy to create and continuously update any image. So computer graphics are possible, like live computer graphics are possible precisely because of this digital character of the image. If the digital image is nothing but a set of numbers, well, you can just enter new numbers and you've got a new image. Right? So you can create live perspectival images. Most 3D graphic games effectively are live processing of perspectival images that are done on the fly. And when this imaging is made to respond dynamically to the input of a user, we start to see the production of what we might call machinic visions, as opposed to machine vision. And indeed, we see that humans are increasingly immersed in synthetic visual environments through which they apprehend and interact with reality. And the lineage of this technology in the military context, but I think we should be mindful that the military context is, is, the, is the central one, that many of the technologies that we think of today, such as augmented reality and virtual reality, are descendants of military technology. The, one of the points of origin of this is the heads-up display which is a technology that begins to appear in the 1950s as a means to allow pilots to view critical navigational information without having to look down at their instrument panel. So in the 1950s, it becomes increasingly uh, problematic for aircraft designers in the military context. Is what, there's all this, these aircraft are becoming increasingly complex and the environments in which uh, aerial combat might take place is so intense and fast-paced, it's not very practical to have uh, the pilots having to look down at their cockpit continuously and go back and forth between what they're seeing outside the cockpit and the actual instrument panels. So heads-up displays are a way of displaying information onto uh, uh, a glass uh, surface that the pilot can look at while he's observing the view from the cockpit. Similar displays eventually mounted directly onto the user's head or helmet. These are helmet-mounted displays as opposed to heads-up displays. But things get really interesting when the display is made sensitive to the user's movement. Because this effectively closes the information loop and constitutes what becomes known as a visually coupled system. Right? Because the, the visual display is feeding information to the, to the viewer and the viewer, through the movements of their head, for example, is sending information to uh, the display technology that's going to update it. Because it needs to keep uh, the display in sync with the movement of the head. You can furthermore tether uh, sensors to the HMD, so you can allow the user, for example, to see an infrared display through their helmet, or you can tie it to weapon systems and develop what's referred to as a look and shoot capability. Just look at a target and the weapon system will automatically aim at that target. The most advanced of HMD's helmet mounted displays today is the forthcoming F-35 helmet. The F-35 helmet allows users to have an unobstructed 360 degree view. In other words, there are cameras located around the F-35 and these cameras all feed into the helmet which means that the user who's wearing the helmet can look around and what they will see is the view outside these cameras. So for instance, one of the consequences is that they can look between their legs and what they will see is the ground. They won't see the floor of their cockpit. They, they, they can look out their helmet as if they were somehow 10,000 feet in the air in an empty structure. The idea, of course, is that they will have greater situational awareness, better understanding of the area in which they are, and make them more effective in aerial combat situations. So this is the advanced technology of the day. But if we want a glimpse of what the longer term future of military systems of machinic vision might be, we actually have to go back to research undertaken in the 1980s. I present to you Super Cockpit. A super cockpit is a project that began in the late 1970s and is initially intended as a simulator to test cockpit designs in real aerodynamic situations. So some scientists decided, well, when we're trying to design <coughs> new cockpits, wouldn't it be simpler if we could just synthesize it in a, in a, in a visual simulator 
rather than have to build physical cockpits and test them. And the ideas were we could apply these systems and then we could send pilots up in the air and they could, through their helmets, actually see this virtual display of the cockpit and we, they could fight virtual targets and we could gain an understanding, a much faster and cheaper understanding of the best layout for their cockpit. But what eventually evolved as part of this project was the idea that the virtual cockpit might actually not simply be the best way to test uh, potential layouts, but actually might be the optimal interface for combat in, in live situations. So that you would no longer need want pilots to operate aircraft by looking at physical interfaces, but you would have them immersed continuously in a kind of virtual display. Here we have, for example, a kind of a, a artist rendition of how of what the view might be within the super cockpit. So the pilot would be presented with an entirely streamlined vision of the environment. Uh, targets would be highlighted, and objects of interest would be there, the key uh, information relating to the status of the aircraft, the state of the weapons and so on would be, would be available. Virtual maps could be presented to them in, in the form of globes that they could point at. Very kind of fantastical ideas were developed as to what these virtual environments might look like. The key for these researchers that was that the virtual reality medium could be the environment in which the natural, perceptual, cognitive and psychomotor capabilities of the operator could be most effectively harnessed. So the image here now serves both as a cognitively optimal representation of reality and the very control interface for action upon it. So because the users would be expected to press on these virtual uh, on virtual buttons or virtual uh, interfaces and there would be responses and actions in the real physical aircraft as a result. Of course, you wouldn't necessarily even have to have pilots in the aircraft. You could have them located on the ground, remotely flying these aircraft through these uh, virtual reality interfaces. Now, the Super Cockpit project didn't come to fruition. Uh, it went through a number of years of research and then in the end, the Cold War ended, funding was discontinued and obviously the, the, the vision of it was probably far ahead of the available uh, technology but it nonetheless was an important pioneer of virtual reality technology and it has descendants in a number of current systems for example the synthetic vision system a uh, piece of equipment that's increasingly uh, uh, installed in military and civilian aircraft a synthetic visual uh, system is a display that allows a pilot to see out of the cockpit um, a simulated environment of the space in which they are. And one of the way, one of ways you might use it is, for example, if you want to land a plane in extremely bad weather, well, rather than try to fly it through almost zero visibility, you can land the aircraft by flying the simulation, by effectively flying by reference to the synthetic visual display. And this technology uh, is here right now. Um, drone technology or drone remote control centers now increasingly are applying synthetic visual displays. So you can see some of the latest uh, remote control uh, installations have very large displays, at the center of which you have the video feed of the drone. But notoriously, these video feeds are quite narrow fields of vision. You can't actually see that much. And around that, you've got a synthetic environment so that the, the uh, virtual reality effectively reproduces everything that the pilot would see if they, if they had you know, a very large cockpit to look at rather than a small uh, <coughs> video feed. So there is a, a legacy of the super cockpit technology uh, which I think will continue to develop and I think more widely all the augmented and virtual reality technology that we're seeing right now is also a descendant of it. But there is perhaps even a more radical endpoint to the development of military imaging. This is Ivan Sutherland. Sutherland is perhaps one of the most important figures in the history of computing, despite the fact his, his, his uh, status is uh, not equal to that, uh, to that importance. 
1963, he, was, he invented what arguably was the first graphical user interface, Sketchpad. But that's not even what I want to talk about now. He was notably the head of DARPA's Information Processing Techniques Office between 1963 and 1965. DARPA, in case anyone doesn't know, is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, the R&D arm of the US military, uh, notably responsible for the internet and lots of other technologies. And a few years after his work at DARPA, uh, Sutherland developed the first virtual and augmented reality head-mounted display, which he's wearing in this photograph. It was called the Sword of Damocles. The reason being that in order to, to set up this system, you had a very large cons uh, insulation above your head, so it threatened to fall on you at any moment, as uh, the eponymous Sword of Damocles. And it was a very primitive uh, system could only show very basic wireframe, wireframe images, but it was effectively a virtual reality system. You could see basic geometric cubes, and if you moved your head, the image changed. It basically, established the principles of subsequent systems. But the most interesting thing here is that Sutherland wrote a few years earlier, in 1965, in the last year of his time uh, with DARPA, a short paper in which he tried to imagine what the ultimate display might be. So he, he was conceptualizing well, what, is it, what is display technology and what is the ultimate display. And he speculated that the ultimate display would have to be some form of kinesthetic display capable of stimulating all the human senses. So the ultimate display wouldn't just be a visual display, it would be an auditory display, it would be a sensorial display, it would be able to simulate or to, to provide a representation of every single sense. Such a display, he says, would allow users to experience all sorts of fantastical objects uh, summoned by the controlling computer. So he, for example, imagined that you could, users might be able to experience a round triangle or negative mass. But his conclusion is a rather more somber and instructive one. The ultimate display, he says, would, of course, be a room within, the within which the computer can control the existence of matter. A chair displayed in such a room would be good enough to sit in. Handcuffs displayed in such a room would be confining. And a bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. With the ultimate display, representation and its object become virtually indistinguishable, since they all have the same material efficacy in the world. Sutherland's final, choices, final choice of illustrations Furthermore, recalls the elementary function of the martial image to fix objects for their targeting. Yet he goes one step further in encompassing the whole process within the single realm of imaging. The handcuffs immobilize and the bullet kills without ever leaving the display. Such that in the wars of the distant future, being caught within the war machine's imaging capability may well signify being already at its absolute mercy. Thank you. Very appropriate ending note on that. Uh, we're going to open up the floor for questions now, so feel free to ask them. We're going to take about three, two or three at a time and then get them answered. So. Basically, what would be the point of uh, having such a display that can kill you? Like, isn't it kind of uh, you know, like against the, the advantage you are gaining? Shall we? <laughs> are we actually living in such a display already? <laughs> I mean, not really. I mean, like the operators of the drones are not uh, like. They, they, they are not shocked by electricity when they miss or anything like that. I mean, like. Yeah, third question to you. I have a slide with um, sort of this aerial top down view, and I heard of the vector graph as a, uh, as a technology. Yeah. The vector graph. Yeah. Uh, the vector graph to basically a very sort of um, uh, primitive way of 3D imaging. And I'm just wondering whether that was it in a way. I could never quite imagine it. And I don't know if what you 
show was the vector graph. I'm not sure, sorry, you have to clarify. Do you mean the stereoscopic pictures that the... Yeah, that was, uh, maybe that's the first third of the presentation when uh, there's a person going basically mm -hmm. over like a 3D image uh, top down. And yeah, uh, I, think I understand you mean. it's like a reconnaissance sort of tool. And I heard the same for a vector graph. I thought that the vision of the vector graph was horizontal, but this one is in a way top down. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether I had the, my, 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 uh, my imagination was wrong or whether that's actually the case. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay, I'll, I'll just take those quickly yep. and then. Um, well, just to go to the first question, well, I think the thing about the ultimate display is that it would be the ultimate weapon, right? Of course, you wouldn't want to use the display on yourself. That wouldn't be much. Good, but if you if you if if you capture the enemy within the ultimate display, then the image would be the ultimate weapon. The image that you could conjure through it would be the ultimate weapon. Um, as to whether we live in one today, well, I'll leave that to start there. <laughs> Anyone can pick that up if they want. Um, on this uh, on this particular, well, let me just say a little bit more about it. Um, the stereoscope was something that came about actually very early in the history of photography, so in, probably by the 1860s <coughs> or 70s, people worked out that if you took pictures from slightly different angles and you put them together and you, well, you, you put them together and you presented one to each eye, you get a kind of 3D effect. That, that's the one we experience when we look at you know, 3D films or, and so on. Um, the idea in the reconnaissance context is you want to exploit that, diff, uh, that effect in order to gain information that you wouldn't obtain from a single photograph. Now, what you actually create with that effect is a quite unnatural form of vision in many ways because it's not, this is not replication. So classic stereoscopic tricks were, were, are ones that imitate what, you, what, what it would look like as a human, as, a, as, a, as, a, as normal human vision, right? You watch a, a, th a 3D film, it's trying to show you depth perception in a, in a way that imitates normal human vision, which is stereoscopic, right? We have two eyes, they have slightly different angles to what you're looking at, hence you, you get a sense of depth that is, uh, is, that is heightened compared to a sim simple perspectival image. But in the case of this stereoscope, what you're actually doing is your two cameras are taking images that are spread out much further than normal human vision. What the image that you then experience when you look through a stereoscope these particular stereoscopes is not what you would see from the aircraft. It's what you would see if you were a giant overlooking the Earth, right? Because you, the, the distance of the two images would equivalent to having you know, eyes at several meters apart. And that allows you from the distance at which these photographs are taken to see uh, the height of objects that you wouldn't otherwise see. And that was a useful way of working out you know, what, what you were seeing to, to see, is this, a, is this a building, is this, and how high that building might be, and that provided with <coughs> further information. I don't know whether that answers your question. I'm not sure what a, vector, is, what a vectorgram is, so... Just for, uh, very follow up, have you, of course, with your extreme expertise in the field, have you heard of this actually being applied vertically in the sense that, like, uh, it wasn't top-down, but it was in some way uh, an imposition or superposition of two images? which would happen on a horizontal plane? Oh, horizontal, excuse me. Well, I, I talked about photogrammetry, right, which is uh, the use of um, uh, photographs to take measurements. And there are different techniques. Some techniques are you take a single image and you just do the reverse kind of perspectival geometry. But actually, that's quite an imperfect technique. There, there are ambiguities in an image that make it difficult. Another way is by using several images and effectively you are doing something similar to this. You are using stereoscopy basically to, to to calculate the distance of objects and so on. So, so certain computer vision has got a whole raft of different techniques, but some of the techniques effectively are stereoscopic. So, yeah, that's one of the areas of application. Okay. You mentioned the. Uh, the way how the machines are directed by, by the human vision, but at the end the machines are uh, getting very or they need very abstract form of information. It's, it was seen on the display of the tanks. 
So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different abstract data mm -hmm. you can use for targeting. Mm -hmm. But uh, your right trip is pretty much focused on the realistic display of the, of the situation, which leads me to question if you would consider uh, other forms of display, which perhaps uh, <coughs> does it need to be uh, for human exactly? Because, uh, <coughs> and uh, the, the other question would be why we actually need that kind of display? Because uh, realistically, there's no need to see how the space looks like. Because you only need the data. Okay. Uh, Simple question: How to hide yourself? <laughs> ah. Because it looks like we are going towards a total control, which is rather scary. Yeah. <laughs> Very good question. Maybe in here. Thanks. Hi, Antoine. Hi, Ben. Um, just watching your uh, image on the camera screen here and watching the automatic <laughs> focus track you around, yeah. um, it strikes me that your rather doom-laden conclusion might be slightly overdoing it. Because while this image here with the autofocus tracking you could be used to target you, should we have this uh, hooked up to some kind of ballistic device, we're not using it for that, and it's in fact something you've consented to, to do, to be at the front, to be recorded, etc. It's being used for a very different purpose. And I, I don't wish to appear naive uh, in underestimating the destructive potential and indeed negative potential of such technologies, but I wonder if we do really need to end on the note that the ultimate display is indeed ultimate doom in the way that you seem to suggest. Okay, on the first question, um, I mean, I think you make a good point in the sense that all the displays, all the presentations of visual information that I've shown you, for example, are all designed for humans. The fact of the matter is that machine visions or machines that see, they don't see images in that sense. I mean, they, don't, they, they see data, right? I, so as I indicated, electronic imaging is, 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 is basically numbers, and the machines don't need to ever leave the realm of numbers. They, that's the whole modus operandi is via, is via these numbers. So this, for example, is purely for our benefit. It's to understand how, what the machine, which one, these are, this is a visualization to help us understand what the software, what the algorithm is doing in recognizing a tank. But the, uh, the machine itself is never really leaving the realm of a statistical ensembles. The imaging is produced through capture, through, through it's translated, it's immediately captured as, as numbers and it's processed as such. Um, so visualization is still is ultimately something that's left for, for, for humans, and some of it might be more or less abstract. But if it's abstract, it's, it's generally abstracted because the idea is that it will be easier for us to process. Right? That, that you the super cockpit vision, which is a kind of almost cartoonish vision of what the, the uh, landscape might be or what the operational environment might be. We premise on the idea that this is the key information that the user needs to access. They don't need all the extra realistic visualization that doesn't feed into the task of you know, piloting, targeting, and so on and so on. Um, but I, what, I'm, what, what I wanted to underline is important is that in the move towards electronic images, you've got both machines that see, but also humans that are inserted into new visual environments. That both these things are happening at the same time. So it's not simply that the machines are learning to see and we're kind of being locked out of that and you know, the, the machines will do everything, or see everything in the future. Maybe there's a distant future where that might be the case. But for, for now, for the foreseeable future, it's much more that we're in an increasingly intimate relationship with the machines that see in their own ways, or, or not, as I said, and, and who present us information as well in ways that, is, that we acquire, that we process visually. Hiding. Okay, that's a that's a very important question, and I'm glad you asked it because I have a chapter on hiding. So I have thought about this thing a little bit. But and you're right. Of course, there's that that uh, the account I've presented to you is one of is of increasing visibility and vulnerability. But there are, of course, uh, you know, if you think about the development of uh, military perception, there's continuously been an attempt to counter it. I mean, mil the technologies of military perception really accelerate. In the first, in the early 20th century, in the First World War, and of course that's when camouflage, modern camouflage, is first developed. So there's a whole set of techniques that have been developed since camouflage, stealth techniques, and so on, which effectively rest on similar kind of bodies of knowledge. What you're trying to do is, if you know how military perception works, then you start to have an understanding how you might fool it. 
If you know the kind of algorithms that are used to recognize an object, then you can try and turn them against it. So there's a, clearly a kind of you know, counter practice that attempts to uh, mislead or distract or fool uh, the, the martial uh, gaze. Um, that said, it's, you know, it's increasingly onerous to do so. If you think about the B2, uh, the B2 bomber, uh, which is perhaps the most advanced stealth aircraft in the world, I mean, this is an aircraft that costs a billion dollars, so you're not, you're not going to have many of them. Uh, so, they, so it may be that uh, there are means to counter it te technically, but they are increasingly onerous. However, I think that there is increasingly a countermeasure that is being put in place. And that countermeasure is a kind of form of strategic camouflage, which is to say, rather than trying to, only to try to technically counteract military perception, what, you do, what you're seeing is adversaries uh, vanishing from the battle space. And one technique is to basically conceal yourself. You might call, well, the terminology I quite use is, is that is that used by Reza Nagostani, hyper camouflage. Where basically you conceal yourself within the enemy society, and you attack that society, at, you know, without any warning. And I think that's one of the things that we have to think about, particularly when we are situated in to the, in the kind of parts of the world which are being developing and pushing this kind of military perception. Is that the vision behind it that, well, we're going to have this wonderful targeting technology and we can target anyone in the world and, you know, this is a, a recipe for ultimate power. What we're seeing, I think, as a result of it is actually a dissolution of the battlefield and we're increasingly seeing war kind of molecularizing and, and resurfacing within our own societies in ways that we might find quite discomforting. So I think that there's a, there is a counter-movement, there's a kind of count, a reaction to that dominance of perception and one that actually has you know, quite unpalatable effects, I think. So, yeah, that would be the beginning of a conversation about, about that. Um, and Ben, um, well, um, let's see. Yes, of course I end with a fairly doom-laden kind of presentation. Um, that's not to say, I mean, for start, obviously, and I don't need to tell artists this, but, you know, images can have em emancipatory effects as, as much as they can have uh, controlling, dominating ones. Um, so, you know, it's not the case that the whole history of image production can be reduced to this kind of instrumental targeting. There's lots of ways in which uh, it isn't. In fact, of course, the history of art took a very sharp turn with once the once photography appeared was the kind of conventional representation whether the, the art of the renaissance which was trying to depict things in a kind of realistic fashion that kind of was abandoned with the turn to modern art where the idea was we're not going to compete with photography we're just going to do something completely different and this is often art that's not kind of instrumentalized or doesn't have that instrumental dimension that perhaps the perspectival image had um, but I think it's, I mean, I guess why I come here is to, it would come in is to, to, I think, highlight what I think is neglected is precisely to the, to the extent to which the image is also instrumental. The image is also tied into technologies of location, technologies of perception, and so on. But even beyond, but and bounding in your direction as well, uh, the ability to correlate vision with location to target in the sense of to send something to a particular point in space, that can also have non-military applications. And there are lots of very positive effects of uh, technologies of computer vision, of mapping, and, and so on. So these are not strictly, they don't have to be strictly military technologies, but we should be mindful that they have been largely developed in a military context, or at least the, the military history is central to them, and we, we need to understand it. That's not to say technology can't be appropriated, can't be retooled, can't be repurposed, and, and so on. But I think we need to be mindful of the military context and the trajectory of that, of that military technology. Sorry. <laughs> Just if I may very quickly respond mm. to, to Antoine with a couple of things. One, one thing I would pick up on is to say, how does the martial gaze interact with other gazes mm. then in this, this field of vision that is opened up? Because that is then a classic social field. 
yes. that is there. And there are, there's the commercial gaze, there's the emancipatory gaze, as you put it. There's, there's these diff an, an intersection of different uh, relations, social and, and different power relations. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we don't still run the risk of over-securitizing this technology. We know that other technologies, uh, other technologies have been developed in, for military use that have gone on to have far non-military, or far yeah. more important non-military applications. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so on. So I think there's, there is a danger of overdoing this. And I think the, the key, key point is who consents and how do you consent to be within this gaze? Because indeed, the, the very point I was trying to raise with you having consented to be in the gaze of this, this machine here uh, and being targeted by its autofocus raises a particular issue. And you can talk about either informed consent or voluntary servitude. We could see a Foucauldian type power relation or other kinds of power relation there. But that surely is the, is the big question. So I'm, I'm always left as something of a technology skeptic on these issues, wondering if it's the technology that's changed it or it's the way that we've failed to actually adapt our social processes and political processes to keep up with it. I mean, very, very quickly, the, I mean, the, the, I have a bit of an issue with that idea of consent because Consent is very contextual. You know, for, for me to, to, to say I don't want to be filmed and I don't want to be recorded is, you know, to step out outside of what would be expected, an expected, sort of an expected norm. Um, so, you know, the set of, there's our expectations that, that, that we will be filmed or we will be recorded. When we, when we you know, use social networks such as Facebook, do, you, do we, in a, of course, in a sense, we consent to everything to do with our data because I ticked a, a box you know, at the beginning when I registered the first time. But, you know, uh, increasingly, well, the, you know, how much of that is conscious and, and how much of that is, is a free f consent when so much of social life increasingly revolves in participating in these kinds of platforms. So I think consent is a quite is quite a complicated thing. It's not is not uh, is not a simple decision that you make and and an opt in and opt out. And therefore, once you've consented, once you you know you, you participate, then you know you have no objection. You can't really raise any objections to it. So yeah, I think consent is a is a complicated thing where these technologies are so widely diffused. And what's more, you know, take take people people objected to Google Glass, particularly when it came out, because they felt they might be filmed by someone else wearing a Google Glass device. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you know, being in a room with lots of people carrying devices means that you are likely to be captured in these, by these devices in one way or another, even if you, you know, take the bold move of refusing to possess one and be involved in any way with that technology, you, you will get largely caught up in it anyway. Um, and so I think that's part, you know, that's, that's the thing that's important to, to me, I think, is that many of these technologies we find ourselves implicated and caught up in them, whether we know, we know or not. I mean, how many times a day are we, are we being photographed by spy satellites? And obviously, it's insignificant to <laughs> the, the, the owners of these spy satellites that I feature in these videos. But as a matter of fact, we are continuously being uh, caught in, in, in these imaging processes, whether we like it or not. I'm not sure whether we can voluntarily opt out of that. Yeah, by the way, what happened with the Google Glass is that <laughs> I haven't heard of that like for, for how many, for years now. Has that like gone? Um, uh, my sense was partly the technology was a little bit immature and it wasn't you know it, it wasn't compelling necessarily. But I think there was a kind of social objection to it. People uh, objected to it and didn't like it, um, or didn't or or there was a stigma attached perhaps to it, or simply perceived not to be cool enough. But I think this is just that, that doesn't sound like a plausible um, kind of explanation for it to dis for it to disappear, really. But Not to disappear, yeah. because I think the technology will resurface in some way or, or, or another. And it may have to contact lenses. Or? It may exactly. It may have to go through contact lenses or other forms of displays that may be less obvious. The, the, you know, the problem about the glass in part was it's a very obvious thing that you're wearing. Mm. Yeah. You know, you taste it. You can judge it, but a lot of people will find it perhaps not very stylish. Yeah. And so on, so on. But but the basic idea of the technology, which is really just an an, an embodiment of the augmented reality and virtual reality technology I was talking about, I think it's a foregone conclusion that it will, it will it will it will spread and it will acquire kind of a, a mass usership at some point in the future. I think it also goes to your example of the camera obscura, where uh, with the visual glasses of Google, mm -hmm. it was obvious that you had some kind of uh, visualizing. Uh, perspective, but if you have contact lessons or something more hidden, uh, you can observe and record and 
not be observed, observing. So it goes back and forth on that. And that might change. I mean, there's a, some speculative fiction where these glasses or these Google Glass glasses are used in warfare situations. And I'm thinking of ghost fleets, for mm -hmm. example. But. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that note? Or? Uh, any thoughts, instead of having this external device, looking to a future where we're actually going to enhance uh, our capability by, I don't know, become a little bit more robotic? Mm -hmm. So instead of having this display outside, it's within ourselves? Well, I mean, I'll argue that's already, you know, that's kind of what I'm, uh, part of what I've been talking about anyway. We, these technologies are, what's happening is that there's a, we are increase, increasingly in very tight feedback loops with our technologies. You know, that we, this is the kind of visually, visual, visual coupled system I was, ta I was talking about in the military context. We, are tethered with machines which we, to which we feed information through our control interfaces and so on, and they feed information back to us. And whether these systems are embedded in our flesh or whether they're external, functionally, they work in the, in the same way. You know, so you can, your, your mobile phone works as you know, an extension of your cognition, whether you hold it in your hand or whether it's a chip in your brain. It really functionally works in the same way. Whether it enhances us or not, that's a, that's a big debate we can have. I mean, there's lots of ways in which clearly these technologies are, are, are empowering. Um, but they are also controlling. And controlling, you know, controlling doesn't mean that we're just dominated by the technology. It means that feedback, cybernetics, is about control. We control these systems and they control us. And that's the very nature of these information flows. Where that gets us, I think that's the discussion and the, the consideration that we, we have to have. Um, it's certainly not, I mean, there's a military context in which we might want to think about what the ultimate goal of these technologies are. There are other contexts which don't necessarily have to be military. I don't think, I don't think because technologies have appeared in the military context that they, they are destined to remain military. Um, but we might want to think what it says about our societies that most of these technologies are being pioneered through military, uh, military efforts. It says something about the centrality of war and the military in the world in which we live in. Kind of goes back to the central idea of the martial gaze of that, of that point. Mm -hmm. Everything feeds into the war machine on that note. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take a last round of questions. Anything around there? Okay. Dustin. Okay, so I'm going to fumble with the question. Um, but I would be interested because you were, I mean, in your essay about the lethal weapon you were discussing about, so kind of the laser, the laser chart, the 360 laser chart, and I also somewhat surmised that this was kind of a terminal point in terms of vision, if, if, if I may, uh, but I would be interested if you could perhaps elaborate on that. So th this is a, uh, yeah, this is a, an aspect of the, the, the book that I, that's contained in an article that's forthcoming, which was thinking about the, the, this relationship between perception and targeting in terms of, of sensorial development. And in a sense, the, the end point of that is the development of the laser. Because the laser technology is both, is, is, happens to be a technology that's a sensorial technology in the way in which optics, radar, infrared are, is. You can use lasers to make distance measurements, for example. You can make maps using laser. But laser is also weaponizable. Right? You can make laser beams that will uh, you know, set fire to things or blow holes through things. And the laser, in that sense, kind of common, it is a kind of form of combination of a particular process of <coughs> extension of vision because in the laser we have the uh, line of sight that becomes also the line of the, of the weapon. And most technology take the sight and feed that into the line of the weapon. But with laser you've got the kind of convergence, the coincidence, in fact, of the of the weapon and the vision, so so laser is also one form of combination uh, of uh, uh, of of the of the martial gaze. Can I ask you this question? Sorry. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Didn't know if it was exclusive enough. <laughs> I, I think it's awfully interesting looking at it from a perspective also from cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, and how we've infused uh, this nexus into how we terminal or put terminals to this.
uh, for example, taking an image of a disk uh, is just a hash, uh, a bunch of numbers and, and letters. So it's interesting how we utilize that. Uh, and we're feeding into this terminology uh, that ends with this martial gaze. Mm -hmm. Very interesting concept. Um, well, we're going to close up with that. Uh, that kind of closes up also uh, his book title, Martial Gaze, will be coming out soon, uh, published there. Uh, if you guys want to come back to this lecture as well through video, uh, we have a recording on there. You can check on the diffractionscollective.org new uh, website. Uh, we also have a blog line going up there, so if you're interested in contributing um, and participating on there, go for it. Um, if there's any other questions for Antoine, you can conclude with them after uh, the presentation. So uh, thank you for coming, and uh, thank you for making it. Thanks.